today we are very pleased uh, to be hearing from Matthew Mason, who is a professor of history here at BYU. Um, he received his PhD in history from the University of Maryland in 2002, taught for a year at Eastern Michigan University before joining the BYU faculty in the fall of 2003. Um, he teaches a variety of courses on the history of slavery, early America, and Britain, and he has published articles in a variety of journals of national and international reach, and he also has, has authored, co-authored, co-edited numerous books. Let me mention some of those. You'll see that he is uh, extremely well qualified to be addressing us today uh, on uh, his topic, right? So um, his book, Slavery and Politics in the Early American Republic, was published in 2006. And then his book, Apostle of Union, a political biography of Edward Everett, was published in 2016. And he's also co-edited books that include John Quincy Adams and the Politics of Slavery, Selections from the Diary, and Contesting Slavery. Um, the politics of bondage and freedom in the new American nation. So he's a, he's a terrific historian who has done a lot of work on the role of, uh, and function of slavery in, in early America and its effect um, throughout the Republic on, on all um, aspects or all um, sections of the population. And so we're really uh, excited to hear from Matt today um, please join me in the virtual way we have of welcoming him to the Kennedy Center. And Matt, the, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stan. Thanks for that uh, generous introduction. I'm also grateful to the Kennedy Center for helping to fund the research that is part of, that I'll be talking about today, an ongoing new book project on the politics of slavery between Britain and America, the United States, for a long uh, period of time. I'm excited for this opportunity to explore for the first time publicly some of the research I've been doing in part enabled by uh, funding from the Kennedy Center. Um, across my career, I've been interested among other questions in the um, issue of how slavery entered politics, political debates that did not seem at first to have anything to do with slavery. Political debates that seem to be about other issues and seem to have no surface uh, relationship to the issue of slavery, but then slavery uh, participants in those debates injected slavery into those uh, debates, and therefore the debates ended up being in part about uh, slavery. Um, that is constantly fascinating to me, um, and the first time that happened in an extended way is what I want to talk about today. In the Anglo-American debate uh, leading up to the American Revolution, beginning with debates surrounding taxes like the Stamp Act and other taxes levied by parliament on North American colonies that then the North American Patriot Movement protested against and that led into the American Revolutionary War. And on the surface, those debates over taxation, representation, military force, the nature of the empire, the nature of sovereignty within the British Empire seem to have nothing to do with slavery, but slavery was an available weapon for contestants on both sides of that debate. And it very quickly became injected into, into that debate, which had major impact both on the debate itself and on the way people talked about and acted concerning slavery. Um, as I mentioned, the first time this got inter interjected in an extended, uh, intense way was surrounding taxation policy. And the most committed patriots, the mo those most committed to resisting things like the Stamp Act, went immediately, like zero to 60, to the following rhetorical pose. You taxing us, Parliament, without our representation is, uh, constitutes a form of slavery. You are trying to enslave us. Now, of course, that's extreme rhetoric. It was meant to be extreme rhetoric. Uh, pretty soon into the debate, it became sort of a shibboleth amongst American patriots. The best way to signal that you took this stuff seriously, that you were properly alarmed, 
was to use the S word. If you use that comparison of slavery to taxation without representation, it was a wonderful way to signal to your fellow patriots that you were all in. Now, of course, the natural response for those both in America and in Britain who supported these tax taxes, or at least were alarmed by the vociferousness of the American patriots reaction to those taxes was to roll their eyes at best. Are you serious, American patriots? Most of whom are yourselves slaveholders. In saying that the Stamp Act equates to the slavery you inflict on African Americans uh, every day, um, at best, that provokes an eye roll. But it, the most common thing it provoked was the best opportunity for loyalists in North America and those loyal to the uh, ministry's policy in Britain to skewer them as completely inconsistent uh, in their commitment to liberty. They're running around talking about liberty uh, and the rights of man and uh, consent of the governed. And none of those seemed consistent with the idea that they were themselves and enslavers. So that was like the most low hanging fruit and easiest response to American patriots was to call them out as hypocrites. And therefore, everyone on that other side of the debate did so like endlessly. It was the easiest uh, move that one could possibly make. What's fascinating to me is the degree to which the desire for consistency was so very strong on both sides of this debate. And this very often happens very often happens in polarizing debates is people want to be seen as being consistent in their positions. And these patriots, especially in part because they took on the name patriots for themselves, uh, very often with a capital P, needed to demonstrate to themselves, but also to their uh, adversaries that they were consistent patriots as in they cared about the good of their country more than their own self-interest. They cared about big concepts like liberty more than they cared about their own self-interest. The way one Maryland patriot put it in 1774 was that anything that smacks of injustice and partiality among patriots' proceedings will give a handle to our enemies to hurt the general cause. If we look to be partial in our commitment to freedom and patriotism instead of all in uh, and consistently patriotic and de dedicated to liberty, that could give a handle to our enemies to hurt the general cause. Of course, Brit loyalists and uh, people in Britain used that handle that they handed them. Uh, one example of this is the uh, British writer, Josiah Tucker, who wrote in 1776, that the American patriots, as advocates for the supposed equality of mankind, ought to have been the foremost in suggesting a system for the abolition of slavery amongst them. But he knew they would not. For all Republicans, people who are committed to striking down monarchy, all Republicans, both ancient and modern, suggests no other schemes, but those of pulling down and leveling all distinctions above them and of tyrannizing over those miserable beings who are unfortunately placed below them." Unquote. That's a powerful attack amongst many other attacks made by Brit British writers and loyalists. That what you really want is equality for yourselves vis-a-vis -vis those above you, but you certainly don't want to extend that equality and liberty to people below you. Uh, it was a powerful attack. And it, one of the impacts this had on the debate is it forced patriots to be more precise about what they meant by slavery. You can't just loosely say the Stamp Act is slavery. You have to be more precise in saying this is why it is. It constitutes slavery. Or this is why British troops in North American cities constitutes the threat of enslavement. They had to be more precise. It, it, it made the debate more refined as well as more uh, emotional. Uh, um, an unexpected tangent, I mean, as obvious as this whole consistency angle seemed to me at first, I was like ready to yawn at it. Like, okay, I know that's the immediate response that uh, British loyalists are going to have is to call them out as hypocrites. That seems almost so predictable as to be boring to me, but it had all these kind of interesting side tangents or uh, adjunct ways in which this became an issue. 
One of the unexpected tangents of this issue of consistency is a hot debate at the start of the American Revolutionary War about whether those American patriots constituted rebels, this hotly uh, contested term rebels. From the British ministry's point of view and parliament's point of view and George III's point of view, yes, they constituted rebels and traitors against the British empire, the British crown, the British government, and should be treated as such. But patriots contested that, American patriots contested that saying, no, they were in fact trying to preserve the true principles of the British government and the British constitution. Uh, and in fact, the real rebels were those in power who were abusing their power. Um, uh, interestingly, in August of 1776, so the, just a month after declaring independence, Congress had set up a committee to create a new great seal for the United States of America. And the, the committee came up with a draft seal that had a picture of Pharaoh from Exodus in pursuit of the Israelites and being swallowed up in the Red Sea with the following motto under that uh, depiction, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. If you are ruled, so in other words, if you're ruled by a tyrant, then rebellion is actually no rebellion. It's actually obedience to a higher power uh, to God. This became fascinating in relation to slavery when in 1775, November 1775, Lord Dunmore, the governor of Virginia, he was the royal governor of Virginia. So in the midst of this revolutionary war, he was outnumbered, outgunned. He was on the run. In fact, he had to move from the capital Williamsburg to a ship in the Chesapeake Bay to maintain his power. And from that position of weakness, trying to maintain his power, he embraced the following proclamation. He proclaimed in November of 1775 that all indentured servants and African slaves who joined from Virginia joined his cause, the cause of George III, the cause of royal government against these rebels would gain their freedom. So he's posing as a liberator. North American patriots responded that he was actually trying to stir up a new form of rebellion, rebellion by slaves, the most dangerous kind of rebellion in their minds, in white Virginians' minds, an insurrection of slaves. And so he was himself a rebel against the principles of the Constitution and added to that uh, stirring up a slave rebellion. Uh, and so the politics of rebellion and insurrection and who really is a rebel and who is really a traitor uh, got mixed up in the politics of slavery when Dunmore issued that proclamation in 1775. A Williamsburg patriot wrote, for instance, among many reactions to Dunmore's proclamation, whoever considers well the meaning of the word rebel will discover that the author of the proclamation is now himself in actual rebellion, having armed our slaves against us and therefore having excited them to an insurrection even kings, this Williamsburg patriot warned, have lost their heads for treason like that. Uh, that was a fascinating kind of adjunct, but the pol politics of consistency kind of kept churning throughout the whole revolutionary period, both the imperial crisis that led up to the war and throughout uh, the war itself. Um, it is part of the larger purpose of jockeying for the good name of your cause, the, the good reputation, both at home and abroad, of your cause, whether your cause be the defense of royal authority or the uh, American independence. Um, another part of that jockeying for the good name of one's cause was the politics of humanity. And this was the term that was used very often in the 18th century to encompass a wide range of associated values. To be humane was to be civilized, uh, to be governed by law, um, especially international law in a war, to treat humanely people who say the fortunes of war threw into your power like prisoners of war. Um, and both sides were very concerned to be perceived both to domestic audiences and to foreign audiences as being truly humane in all these big civilizational uh, ways. Um, this seems to have especially, based on my research, especially obsessed the American patriots. 
They're an upstart band of colonials who had been long treated as marginal by people in the metropolis in London, a bunch of provincials, a bunch of backwoods yokels who barely were civilized uh, and probably had been degenerating from the British standards of civilization since they settled North America. And so Americans were, American patriots were especially kind of touchy about any accusation that they were being inhumane or uncivilized in the way that they waged this war. Um, the commanders on both sides seemed to be, were constantly lecturing each other, especially about the treatment of prisoners of war, um, that they were being savage while we are being restrained and moderate and civilized and humane. Um, Robert R. Livingston, who at that moment was the president of Congress in 1778, wrote, a, I think, a really telling letter to George Washington along these lines. He was lauding George Washington's restrained, moderate, humane approach to the prisoners of war that had fallen into his hands. And he said, this cannot fail to impress Europe with the most favorable ideas of the humanity, politeness, and literary address of a people colonists, whom they have hitherto been taught to consider as but just emerging from barbarism, uh, unquote. He then mentioned this is why he cared so much about the reputation of America. Uh, those were his exact words, the reputation of America. And so much of that hinged on whether America's cause, at least the American patriots cause, could be seen as humane. You might think that's the most natural move in the world for Brit the British when Lord Dunmore had issued his proclamation and then other British commanders followed suit and offered freedom to American slaves if they would fight for the British. To pose as liberators and as humane, that's the most humane thing to do is to liberate slaves. And they certainly did that. Um, and there are many people on that side of the debate who claimed that this freeing of American slaves put the British in a superior position civilizationally in terms of humanity to those enslaving Americans. Um, but the Patriots, what fascinated me is the Patriots found multiple ways to contest the high ground, even on that issue, even when they were not willing to uh, emancipate slaves and reacted with horror when the British did. They found ways to contest the politics of humanity in some really creative ways. Uh, politics can be creative sometimes, and this is one example. One is the ongoing charge made by multiple people, both in private and in public, that the British were not in fact liberating American slaves. They were in fact luring them to British lines and then selling them into slavery in the British West Indies. Now, of course, the British still had many slave colonies. The British were not an abolitionist power uh, in the American Revolutionary War, despite this policy of freeing American slaves. So there's that kernel of truth, right? Like Jamaica and Barbados are still slave colonies, uh, growing sugar by enslaved laborers. Um, and so this constant charge that is almost completely baseless, but as we see in politics, it doesn't really matter whether a charge is baseless. It was repeated over and over again that the British actually are not liberators. They are tricky enslavers and making the slavery of, say, a Virginia slave even worse by sending him or her down to Jamaica. It's a fascinating charge. Um, a, a, an adjunct to that is the idea that the freeing of American slaves was not some humane act of liberation, but was in fact a war crime. That it was like the nuclear option of the 18th century to embrace the arming of a slave, an enslaved population against the free population uh, with which you were fighting. Um, Josiah Atkins, uh, a Connecticut man in the Continental Army, really encapsulates this well. I mean, I could trot out source after source. This is especially striking. Jo Josiah Atkins was himself anti-slavery. He was repulsed as he, a Connecticut soldier, marched through Virginia to fight the British. And what he saw when he passed, say, George Washington's plantation. He exclaimed in his um, diary, alas, that persons like Washington who pretend to stand for the rights of mankind, for the liberties of society, can delight in oppression and that even of the worst kinds, unquote. So he was appalled by American slavery on the scale that he encountered it in Virginia. 
But he also, in another diary entry, reported having marched by 18 or 20 Negroes that lay dead by the wayside, putrefying with the smallpox. How such a thing came about appears to be this, the Negroes here being much disaffected, arising from their harsh treatment, flocked in great numbers to the British general Cornwallis as soon as he came into these parts. This artful general takes a number of them, several hundreds, inoculates them with the smallpox, and just as they are all growing sick, he sends them out into the country where our troops had to pass and repass. This atrocity was a piece of Cornwallisian cruelty. That's a wonderful word, Cornwallisian cruelty, uh, unquote. That's a remarkable charge. The idea that General Cornwallis was using American slaves, purposely infecting them as biological weapons. Um, that's an outlandish charge with no bit, uh, evidence behind it. But it was nurtured by, the, by this idea that nothing good could come from the British ministry and the British generals. There's no way they could really be liberators. They must be waging a war of atrocity, including by freeing and arming American slaves. Um, as such, the British policy was consistent with, in the American patriot's eyes, consistent with, rather than a repudiation of, or a, a, an aberration from, the British overall abuse of authority. Uh, contestation over who uh, used legitimate power and who had legitimate power to do things like taxing was right at the heart of the American Revolution. And so American revolutionaries could never accept any position other than that the British were constantly abusing their power, including in freeing American slaves. Um, Lund Washington, a cousin to George Washington, uh, captured this really well in a letter in 1775. He wrote to George, Lord Dunmore's Negro soldiers are, it is said, commanded by Scotchmen. And I should pause here and note that in the English imagination in the 18th century, Scots, pe uh, people of Scottish descent were suspect at best in terms of their commitment to liberty. They, they had an image of being hostile to English traditions of liberty. So this is really, and Lord Dunmore was of Scottish origin. So this is a really loaded charge. Lord Dunmore's Negro soldiers are, it is said, commanded by Scotchmen, proper officers for slaves, for they themselves possess slavish principles. And this idea that the ministry represented slavish principles rather than the principles of liberty um, is, helps to nurture this idea in American patriots, white American patriots idea uh, minds that the British government could never do anything good. And so even liberating slaves, maybe especially liberating slaves, was a war crime rather, and, and a, a con consistent with their abuse of power rather than anything other than this. One thing that I should note about this is, is to correct any idea that African Americans were inanimate objects in these debates. Um, yes, slavery got injected into these politics by white politicians. And they tended to want to use African Americans as tools in this in these debates. But note how this issue of slave enslaved African Americans running to British lines becomes politicized as uh, North American patriots are scrutinizing the degree of consent that they had. Were they stolen? Were they lured away? Or did they go of their own volition? So the agency of African Americans drives this politics. If, the, if they had not responded to Lord Dunmore's appeal, then this would not be so hotly political. But then also the degree of agency that they were perceived to have is politicized in this. Um, Edmund Pendleton, a South Carolina patriot in 1776, wrote a nice interesting little phrase in a letter that I think captures this he said, in a recent raid, the British had carried off two Negroes believed to be willing captives. Believed to be willing captives. They're scrutinizing how much uh, agency, how much will was involved with these African-American people running away to the British. Um, 
that puts African-American actions right at the heart of these debates um, rather than just being inanimate objects. Now, another, uh, besides consistency and humanity, another kind of principle or core value that was highly uh, contested during the American Revolutionary Era, especially during the war itself, was the idea of honor. And it may not surprise none of you uh, to know that honor is highly associated with military men, military conflicts. Are you an honorable soldier? Are you in, in some way dishonorable? And it, therefore, is your cause disgraced by you? Or is the honor of your cause upheld by your actions? And the idea of honor attaching to either the Patriots or the British cause um, gets mixed up in slavery also in really complicated and I think revealing ways. That began actually before the war in, with the idea that Africans, especially, but not only enslaved Africans, were kind of the essence of disorder, but also dishonor in American society. They had suffered what um, one sociologist, Orlando Patterson, has called social death by being enslaved. They were treated as the essence of dishonor at the very bottom of American society. And, and that's true of Anglo-American culture broadly. And so treating African-Americans as the very avatars of dishonor, um, man, one of the impacts of that is, is that white American patriots were very reluctant to enlist African-Americans in their army, even despite the dire manpower shortages that developed pretty soon into the war after the initial enthusiasm faded. Uh, as white American patriots debated whether African Americans were a useful way to supply soldiers, um, many in those debates, not all, but many in those debates argued that would dishonor our cause to associate ourselves with these uh, African, whether or not they're free, these African uh, Americans. Um, uh, Similar to that is the argument that the imperial government, by taxing them without their consent, by treating them like slaves, by dishonoring Americans, free white Americans, had in essence treated them like slaves and treated them like Africans. Um, so there's this long running political association of the dishonor that American patriots perceived to attach to the British treatment of them that made them very reluctant to then uh, embrace enlisting African Americans. Um, George Washington partook of this. Uh, George Washington in his general orders to his army in November 1775, so pretty early in the war, wrote, the rights of mankind and the freedom of America will have numbers sufficient to support them without resorting to such wretched assistance as Negroes, boys unable to bear arms, or old men. So young boys, old men, and telling, he doesn't make any kind of qualification when he says just Negroes. Do you mean free or enslaved? Probably both, of all ages. Themselves are dishonorable, and therefore it would tarnish our cause. We don't need that cause, or need them in a way that would tarnish our cause. That's the way he felt early in the war, and only dire necessity later made him even provisionally think about accepting some states like Rhode Island who were willing to en enlist free African Americans. Um, the British themselves had some complex attitudes. Lord Dunmore seems like an enthusiastic liberator and so do other British generals who embrace that policy uh, of freeing African Americans. But amongst both British commanders and British politicians and British soldiers, there's a range of attitudes towards these African uh, American potential allies. Um, suffice it to say that the main reason that they enlisted African Americans was not because they wanted to be liberationists or abolitionists, it was military necessity. They're trying to fight a war across an ocean uh, against a determined foe. They need all the help that they can, they can get. But once they had embraced African-Americans as allies, 
And this included also Native Americans who they embraced as allies. Once they embraced them, the dictates of honor, this military value of honor, really strongly encouraged them to keep their word to these people that they had enlisted with the promise of freedom. Um, and so, and it's not just a military value, it's kind of a high civilizational value kind of aligned with the idea of humanity. So politicians shared this idea. Um, whereas Americans believed that uh, the British had violated their honor and their sovereignty by enlisting American slaves. So they have these clashing notions of honor that come to a head in the negotiations at the end of the war about how to dispose of, and that's the kind of terms they use, these fugitive American ex-slaves that had reached British lines. The British were determined to honor the promises made to them. We had promised them, we had listed them under the promise of freedom. We need to honor that. Um, just one example, in a letter of, from August 1782, General Alexander Leslie wrote to General Guy Carleton, who was overseeing, he was the commander in chief in North America. Those enslaved African-Americans, those who have voluntarily come in under the faith of our protection cannot in justice be abandoned to the merciless resentment of their former masters. That's a nice dig to the barbarity of American slaveholders, but it also makes it a matter of national honor to keep the promises that they had made to these uh, runaway American slaves. And they did. They honored the, the, the best estimates we have are about 30,000 American slaves gained their freedom, leaving with the British when the British evacuated, uh, spoiler alert, the end of the American Revolutionary War was British defeat. Um, and, but when they evacuated, they took thousands of American slaves, ex-slaves now, with them uh, into various parts of the British, British Empire. And I think it's really telling that although they did, they did not start out as emancipationists, this principle of honor encouraged them to take an anti-slavery stand as part of their national reputation. And that I think has real significance going forward in British history. So that leads me to kind of some concluding thoughts on what difference did all this make? Um, I think it's all interesting. Uh, to me, it's endlessly interesting. I hope to some of you it was at least moderately interesting. But what difference did it ultimately make, either to the debate surrounding the American Revolution or to slavery itself? I mean, other than those tens of thousands of American slaves who got their freedom, what difference did it make to an enslaved young man in, or young woman in Virginia or Connecticut? Um, well, first, I, would, I hope it's become clear that the way it impacted the debate was to ratchet up the rhetoric. There's been a lot of talk in uh, the United States recently about turning down the temperature of American politics. Um, to inject slavery into any debate was to raise the temperature immediately, was to put it in a microwave uh, and raise the temperature just instantaneously. Um, and all the different ways it entered did that to the politics of consistency, to the politics of honor, to the politics of humanity, and on and on. But in terms of what difference it made on in, in American slavery, this is hotly debated amongst historians to this day. Uh, and the debate is actually pretty simple. Uh, on one side, you have people who say the American Revolution really made no difference in American slaves' lives. These American patriots were so kind of self-centered, these white American patriots, and hobbled by racism, that really it made just kind of the most superficial impact on American slavery, all this rhetoric of freedom and no taxation without uh, representation and so forth, or humanity. Um, on the other side are a group of historians who argue that without the American Revolution, you would have never had an American anti-slavery movement of any appreciable size and organization, you, and therefore you would never have had the American Civil War and the liberation of American uh, slaves. And then there are a group of historians who fall in between. Rather than thinking it's a pro-slavery American revolution or an anti-slavery American revolution that it was hotly contested. Uh, I fall in between. I fall with the 
people who argue that there was no one impact of the American Revolution on American slavery, that it was hotly contested at that moment and going forward. Uh, that there, was, there were pro-slavery impetuses and anti-slavery impetuses coming out of the ideas, but also the experience uh, of the American Revolution. So I'd like to try to make that point as clear as I can. And then I'm sure there are questions. I'd be very happy to take questions. On the anti-slavery side, all this rhetoric, all these values that had then become attached by the debaters themselves to slavery and freedom um, gave abolitionists all kinds of leverage uh, to appeal to Americans' consistency, to their sense of humanity, to their sense of honor in appealing for the abolition either of the slave trade or of slavery itself or both. And these are both black and white abolitionists. One of the remarkable things about early abolitionism is the degree to which it is truly a biracial movement. So in fact, one historian, I, I think persuasively has argued that the first organized abolitionists in North America was a group of a committee, an anti-slavery committee of African-Americans in Massachusetts. And the best definition for abolitionism is organized anti-slavery. Organizing as a group to try to put anti-slavery into action. By that definition, this group of African Americans who gathered together to draft anti-slavery petitions in 1773 were the first organized abolitionist movement in North America. And they leveraged these ideas in powerful ways in these, uh, even before the war had begun. This is 1773 and the war didn't begin until 1775. Um, in the, they published their, uh, they didn't just send these petitions to lawmakers, they published them. And um, in the published version, they challenged those who claimed to be the guardians of our rights to the lawmakers of, Pennsylvania, of Massachusetts, these patriots, to show to the world that they were in fact, rather than only in theory, committed to liberty to show that they were in fact, rather than only in theory, led and influenced by the true principles of liberty and a sincere desire to promote the good of mankind. Emancipation would surely sh serve to show, I can't say that one time fast, would surely serve to show that instead of being pretended friends to liberty, Massachusetts leading statesmen are really hardy for the general and unalienable rights of mankind, uh, unquote. Mike dropped, uh, gauntlet thrown down. Uh, are you really, or are you only superficially committed to all these principles? It's, it's a powerful appeal that this is just beginning. It's made by abolitionists, both black and white, over and over throughout the history of American abolitionism. Um, and they also appeal to humanity. Do you really believe in humanity? Do you believe, really believe in national reputation? The United States, this becomes a powerful appeal, especially in the long run. The United States looked really bad on the world stage because of American slavery. So all these related ideas that at first didn't seem to be related at all to slavery, but by the time the American Revolutionary War was done, were clearly and inextricably linked with slavery, then gave abolitionists a major set of tools to appeal to uh, in their desire to rid America of slavery. However, on the other side, there is a pro-slavery legacy. Uh, there are pro-slavery legacies uh, of the American uh, Revolution. One of the most powerful of them is that North American slaveholders, when they watch the British in, the, time, in a, the chaos of war, offer freedom to their slaves and see tens of thousands of these American enslaved African-Americans take the British up on that offer, despite all the risks involved in running to the British. They realized that if they were gonna be able to control American slavery going forward, they needed to control the American government going forward. Um, a friend of mine, the uh, really accomplished historian, David Wallstreicher, has written about this as a kind of moment of truth for American Slaveholders, And in this moment, they saw the perceived the need to control the state going forward, whether that be their state governments or the national government. 
So if you're ever wondering why did these American slaveholders so determined to protect American slavery as best they can in say the Constitutional Convention or in national politics leading up to the American Civil War, in many ways it's the legacy of the American Revolution that associated forced emancipation with their enemies. And the idea of losing control of the government with the chaos of war and therefore the inability to control American slaves, which slaveholders, like, you may not be surprised to, to learn, valued control. Um, over and over again, they write about how helpless they felt if the British controlled their area, they felt that there was no way they could control their, their enslaved population. Um, Ralph Izard, another South Carolinian patriot, wrote in 1783 to a friend, uh, General Guy Carleton's stance on fugitives, the idea that we're going to protect these promises of liberty, is an evasion of the treaty that the British signed, promising that they would return American slaves. And yet we are not in a condition to help ourselves because of the lack of power in the state level and the national level, given that the British still control large parts of North America. As late as 1783, that's really a telling statement. We are not in a condition to help ourselves. Um, so in short, what I want to argue for is that the American Revolution had a divided and deeply divisive effect on the politics of slavery, both in Britain and in North America, but especially in the United States of America going forward. Um, last week, during the really illuminating roundtable on Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, uh, Professor Rebecca de Schweinitz uh, from the History Department uh, my colleague, she mentioned uh, Kendi's earlier book called Stamped from the Beginning. And it's an argument that America, the United States of America was stamped with the crime and sin of slavery and the, the need to protect it and therefore white supremacy from the beginning. Uh, I would just disagree with that by saying that American slavery did stamp American life from the beginning, but it made it so that America was divided from the beginning. And the, the legacy of the American Revolution as it pertained to slavery was contested from the beginning, not decided at all, um, in, in the, either in the short term or in the long term. So I hope this discussion of how slavery entered into debates that seemed to have nothing to do with slavery helps illuminate how central slavery was to American life. Uh, it was an easy analogy because it was so ubiquitous in American life. This was not reaching to compare anything to slavery. It was, it was so central to North American society and the economy and politics and culture that it was a natural injection into these debates. Um, so, so to me, that helps illustrate how central American slavery was in American history. But also rather than having a uniform effect, it had a divisive effect on American and British history. Um, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy. I assume there are many questions. I'm very happy if there are. Back to you in the studio, Stan. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Matt. That was that was terrific. Um, does show you, right, that a good lecturer who knows his subject well, is passionate about it, can hold your attention completely without the use of slideshows, right? So anyway, thank you. Thank you for that. That was that was really engaging. And we do we do have a number of questions. Uh, we'll see how many uh, we can get to. If you if you have some questions while we're talking, please again send them to me in the chat, and we'll see if we can get to them. Um, the first question is by Abish, and she'd like to ask it herself. So Abish, will you um, unmute yourself and ask Professor Mason your question, please? <laughs> I'm afraid your sound is not, we can't understand you. No, still, still can't. So I'm sorry. Um, why don't you work on that? Oh, oh, did you say it again? Oh, can you hear? Yeah. Um, given the um, debate around how history should be taught in schools with things like the 1619 project, um, what are your opinions, like given all these different perspectives that you've um, looked at and researched? Thank you. That's a great question, Abish. I'm glad you were able to answer, ask it yourself. 
And the 1619 project has been an interesting moment for those who aren't aware uh, of it. It was began in 2019 with the New York Times um, magazine. Uh, so led by a bunch of journalists, but drawing on recent uh, scholarship by historians, arguing that the real founding of America was in 1619 when the first Africans were sold in Jamestown, um, rather than 1776 uh, as a founding for the America, given the centrality of slavery uh, to and race, racism to American life, that the real founding moment was 1619. Um, to me, to that degree, that is very welcome. It puts, whenever, uh, it, it, and I should mention, uh, it, in case you have been uh, sleeping under a rock or something, or not paying attention to history, which I think is the same thing, but it may not be the exact same thing, that it is generated because it was in the New York Times, because it came in such a politically divisive moment in American history, that has been hotly contested, this idea of the 1619 Project. And it, as Avish suggested, has connected to the way American history has been taught is taught because the 1619 project offered for free curricular materials based on this history of America that they had developed. Uh, and so therefore people who resist that idea of teaching that history have been resisting the idea of the 1619 project influencing the way history is taught. I have a twofold response. One, it's a great threefold question. One, it's a great question. <laughs> Two, as a scholar of American slavery who has helped to participate in the, scho the scholarship over the last several decades that has tried to teach that slavery was central to American life, that you can't understand the United States of America without understanding slavery and its legacies. I welcome the 1619 Project. I have interpretive differences with the idea that, uh, that slavery and white supremacy have been uncontested throughout American history and have kind of reigned supreme that is kind of implicit and sometimes explicit in the 1619 Project um, interpretation. But those are matters of interpretation. And, this, uh, and that's what historians do, is we argue over questions of interpretation. But the bare fact of insisting that slavery and its uh, twin, white supremacy, have had an outsized impact on American history, I totally welcome that reaching a larger audience. Oh, that makes sense as an answer, Abish. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Let me, um, we have another uh, question by uh, Daisy who'd like to ask it herself. So Daisy, please, if you unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Hi, Dr. Mason, thanks for your lecture. <clears throat> so I'm wondering, I, I remember being taught in high school just how um, heated the Constitutional Convention was in general, right? And physically, mm -hmm. you know, really hot. Um, but especially on the topic of slavery, um, how do you see these appeals of honor, consistency, and um, humanity going over to that, um, that environment in the Constitutional Convention? Thank you, Daisy. It's a great question. Not surprised. Daisy's taken a couple classes from me. I'm used to getting good questions from Daisy. Um, yeah, that's what made it so divisive is uh, more anti-slavery members of the Constitutional Convention did appeal to all these uh, values. If we value consistency as true lovers of liberty, how can we compromise with slavery? Like by extending the life of the Domestic, the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade to North America, or by rewarding slaveholders with extra power in the House of Representatives or the Electoral College by the Three-Fifths Clause or, or a fugitive slave clause. How, how is that consistent with our values? How does that not look just terrible to the larger world by which they meant the, the European audience? How does that uh, consist with American honor? And on the other side, uh, North American slaveholders, led by the South Carolinians, but not only the South Carolinians, responded vociferously, largely coming from that point that I, that I made towards the end of my talk. They understood just instinctively, based on very recent experience during the American Revolutionary War, that if they let anyone hostile to their interests control the state, that that would severely, if not catastrophically weaken their control over the American slavery. So a lot of this background helps explain why it was so divisive. 
I mean, it should be also noted that they weren't really there to debate slavery. They were there to debate framing a new constitution. But they found it impossible to do that without talking about slavery. And that underscores the point that slavery is just intertwined with all these big issues. I mean, what were they debating other than taxation and power and sovereignty and who had the right to consent to what part of the government? All those things had already been con uh, connected with slavery. So there's just no way they could talk about all those things without talking about slavery. And therefore, that made it more divisive. It's one of the many things that made it kind of almost miraculous they were able to craft a document at all, let alone such a stable document. It's a great question. I hope that makes sense as an answer. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Let me uh, read a question here from Sabina who would like me to read it uh, to you. She says, it was fascinating to hear you talk about how the slaves did not act as inanimate objects in the debates about slavery. Were the opinions of the slaves themselves as polarized as the opinions of free Americans? That's a great question. Um, they were, they, although they mostly fell along the lines of is, what is the best means to gain liberty? Um, it, not shocking probably to say that, that, uh, that American slaves valued liberty. They didn't need American patriots, white American patriots to tell them the value of liberty, right? But the question is, is running to the British or some other route the best way to maintain or to gain, not maintain, to gain the liberty that we seek? Uh, many, tens of thousands, saw the British offer of liberty as a great opportunity, a rare opportunity in a situation in North America in which they were outnumbered and outgunned by white people. Here's a, another group of white people who seem to be pretty powerful, who are offering freedom. But there's so many risks involved with um, the ultimate risk is, of course, if your flight to the British is unsuccessful, but also what if the British don't honor their promises? The British were slave traders, just like the Americans were. Uh, why would they honor promises of freedom to people that they saw as dishonorable? So the debates um, tend to be kind of practical debates as to whether you can trust the offers of freedom and whether it's a risk worth taking. It's kind of a risk reward analysis kind of debate amongst African Americans that then once they act or don't act on that gets politicized as white people react to their actions or uh, inaction. Great. Um, thank you. Um, lots of good questions here. We'll see. We know many of you uh, are going to have to leave, and so we'll we'll continue here for a few minutes um, because there are a number of of really interesting questions here. Uh, another question about how we teach uh, something like the the Revolutionary War, right? Leslie asks this um, that one of the one of the explanations you'll often hear for someone a beloved figure right like George Washington is well they were products of their time right. so what what is what is all of this evidence you have about people calling each other out for hypocrisy and claiming to be proponents of liberty when they enslaved people or or the soldier you know the british soldier with that diary you know complaining about about american uh, slavery how does that influence that narrative and that explanation? Thank you, Stan, and thank you for that uh, question, Leslie. I'll try to answer that without tearing out what's left of my hair because I, I am heartily <laughs> tired of that question, not in the sense of people asking it, but um, kind of the, the, the impulse sometimes behind it is to try to do everything you can to defend the honor, there we are with the honor again, of the sainted American founders. So, um, it's only in that sense that I'm uh, tempted to tear out any hair in response to uh, Mostly when I asked, really trying to learn, it is a, a, actually, I think, a quite useful question. On some issues, I think it would be unfair to judge people in the 18th century by contemporary standards. Like if I wanted to uh, inquire into what George Washington's carbon footprint was, uh, or where he stood on LGBTQ rights, things that were not questions in his day, it would probably be unfair. I think more than probably be unfair to try to impose questions that had not occurred to them on anyone in the past. 
But for questions that did occur to them and that became divisive, it is 100% fair to, uh, not in the sense of sitting in moral judgment as if I'm Jesus Christ on Judgment Day, but to make informed interpretive analyses of the choices people made and the impact those choices had is fair game, I think, uh, for historians as we try to analyze, which I think is slightly different than sitting in judgment on uh, the past. So for George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or Abraham Lincoln or Benjamin Franklin or Nat Turner or any figure in the past, for issues that did occur to them and that were hotly debated in their time, we can assess where they stood on those issues. And when it comes to questions like liberty and equality and the degree to which race and racial inequality should structure American life, the, they did debate those things. In many ways, it seems unfair to say, well, he was a man of our, his time, you can't judge him by our standards, in part because where do we get our standards on things like human equality from that generation, from founding documents like the Declaration of Independence that declare all men are created equal. So any kind of debate in American history that has had to do with equality is informed by the values of the American revolutionary generation. So we can, I think, properly assess whether Thomas Jefferson lived up to the thing he wrote uh, for that committee in the Declaration of Independence. So on some issues, including these issues that were contested in their day, I think it is fair to assess where people stood in those debates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Gideon has a question that I think is related to this. And Gideon, if you unmute, uh, why don't you ask your question now, please? Okay, thank you, Dr. Mason, for what you've gone over. Um, research uh, of what you talked about today, what comparisons do you see in our life today? And also, like, with people who are so like, not determined for the causes that they're fighting for, how can we make sure that those causes aren't negatively affected? Okay, I, I think I heard most of that question. Thank you. It's good to see you, uh, even virtually, uh, Gideon, a former student in a class, but also a really good question. I think I heard enough of that to capture uh, the kind of contemporary relevance of these debates is what the way I gather uh, the question was and, and what can people who are committed to causes now learn from some of this, some of this history. I think it's a really good question. Um, I think, um, if, as an activist, I uh, am inspired by the political tactic that these early African-American abolitionists and then followed by white abolitionists use to appeal to the values of the people they're appealing to, um, to leverage things that they have already gone on record as saying they care about deeply, enough to wage a war of independence surrounding these values, um, to leverage that by appealing to people in relation to things they already care about rather than very often the activists um, kind of impulses to try to grab people by the lapels and say, you must care about my issue for the exact reason that I care about it. And maybe there's some usefulness in that, but I think politically, especially it's more useful to assess what do these people that I'm trying to appeal to already care about? And is there a way that I can connect my concerns to those, to those values? I, as a, I'm involved with anti-human trafficking efforts, both here at BYU and uh, beyond. And, uh, as, and so to that degree, I'm an activist and on other issues surrounding race uh, and so forth. And I find as uh, an activist and would be activist, it's uh, better tactically to, um, to do that. That's one, that's one lesson I take. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're at the, the one o'clock hour. So maybe let me, let me try to combine a couple of questions here uh, to conclude with this one. Um, one of the things you said, you know, you talked about sort of Kendi's book stamped from the beginning and you, know, you might have re rephrased that as divided from the beginning. And so how, you know, so, so one question for example was, um, how does the idea of being a patriot, how has that changed from the Revolutionary War to our own time? Um, but we might also say that that also seems to be a similarly divided right. Right, conception of what it is. So can you just talk about the idea of division mm 
and how that goes through American history up to our to our present day. Yeah, that's a great a great question, and it, I think that that's another kind of com- contemporary analogy to some of what I've been talking about. Is um, yeah, and uh, the term patriotism and everything that surrounds that is a perfect uh, analogy uh, for that. Generally, I find when people are in power in the United States, so say that the administration in the White House or the majority in Congress or the people running their state government, but especially at the national level, reflect your values and you supported them. Patriotism very often means that to support them and and dissent is looked on as unpatriotic. And then if you lose power, then you wanna argue that dissent uh, is patriotic. Um, so that's a long running pa- uh, pattern in American history. But even the term and some of the practices surrounding patriotism have become polarized in recent uh, years. Think about the uh, national anthem, which used to be, uh, at least in my experience, growing up in the late 20th century and early 21st century, meant to be uh, a unifying uh, event with uh, athletes beginning this, but then other people using the national anthem as a, I think, an appropriate form of uh, of protest that has then politicized it into, um, there's a professional sports franchise, I can't remember who, I saw crawling below my screen, at the bottom of my screen on ESPN the other day. Oh, I think it's the Dallas Mavericks. I think because it's so divisive, have stopped playing the national anthem before games. Um, I would guess probably they just want to avoid uh, any issues surrounding it. But surrounding that kind of debate uh, has been a contestation of what does patriotism really mean? Does it mean love your country or leave it, support everything that your government does, or does it mean the right to dissent and the right to try to improve the country that you love? Um, So patriotism is a perfect example of something that was hotly contested its meaning back in the American Revolutionary era and is hotly contested today. So it's a great ending question. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Mason. Wonderfully engaging, rich uh, discussion uh, you know, in, your, in your talk. And you can tell from the questions it elicited all kinds of you know, questions about the time period, the Revolutionary War itself, and then its implications for us, uh, for us today. So thank you very much. I'm sure if uh, we were not virtual, we would have a very loud round of applause for you. But thank you again for sharing your research and, and, and time with us. Much appreciated. Right back at you. Thank you for everyone's attention and really good questions.